Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the to the first Max Weber lecture of this calendar year. And we're very happy to have uh, Johanna Gemacher uh, as our speaker. And without further ado, I will leave the introductions to Milos Vodinovic, who is a Max Weber fellow with us uh, here. So please, Milos. Good evening, everyone, both to those physically present and to those following us via Zoom. Uh, I am happy to welcome you all to the Max Weber lecture, you who said first in this calendar year, but fourth one in this academic cycle. Um, I'll try to be short. And given that this is Max Weber lecture, uh, it somehow seems appropriate to quote Max Weber himself. So in his famous essay, Science as a Vocation, Max Weber wrote, if the young scholar asks for my advice with regard to habilitation, meaning attempt to get permanent position, the responsibility of encouraging him can hardly be borne. Weber concluded, and I'm quoting, academic life is a mad hazard. But he did not talk about women at all. However, someone will. Tonight's lecture is titled Impossible Careers in Scholarly Households gendered scholarly persone around 1900. Our distinguished guest is Johanna Gemacher, who is Fernand Brodel Fellow with the Department of History and Civilization. And she is a professor at the Institute for Contemporary History at the University of Vienna. And a um, list of Professor Gemacher's publication is too long to be elaborated at the moment. So I'll just mention the last book. It is co-authored work together with Elisa Heinrich and Corinna Esch which is dedicated to Käthe Schirmacher, one of the first German women to earn a doctorate, and I believe we'll hear more about Käthe tonight. Professor Gehrmacher lecture tonight seems to me to include uh, two strands that are visibly present in her research, and please correct me if I'm wrong, and I think namely on the one side, women's or gender's history, and on the other, the focus on the individuals and constituents of wider social processes. So without further ado, Professor Gehmacher, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Juhu, for the very kind uh, invitation. And thank you, Milos, for uh, your introduction. I'm really greatly honored by the invitation to give this prestigious lecture. Impossible careers, scholarly households, and gendered scholarly persona, the concepts used in this lecture's title, career, household, and persona, point to different levels of my argument. Namely, the, first, the institutional conditions and framings of a career along lines of gender, class, race, and other differences. Then the practical arrangements of academic and other scholarly households. And thirdly, the symbolical level as to who can be imagined as an academic and what character masks learned persons used to negotiate their place in the academia. As I will argue, these three dimensions are closely linked with each other, often in a messy way, but they work along different logics. So I have to do something. No. To give you a first idea of these connections, I would like to start with a dog. In this 14th century book illustration, the little animal is sleeping at the feet of humanist thinker Francesco Petrarca. One might wonder why the illustrator bothered to include a puppy in the portrait of the famous scholar among his precious books. However, as Patrick Retoswert has shown, many early modern scholars in their study were depicted with an animal companion, preferably a little dog. Gadi al Ghazi, in his inspiring work on the histo historical production of the scholarly self, argued that these dogs served as a visual representation of the scholar's particular and precarious relation to the world. The open window in the background is another symbol of this relationship. The everyday noises of the household surrounding the person portrayed can intrude, but they cannot disturb the thinker's contemplation, his concentrated posture. 
As Algasi argues, the dog in the study seems to articulate a specific model of scholarly solitude. Not simply the wish to be alone, to avoid others' company, but to have company at will without entangling oneself in a web of reciprocal obligations." End of quote. The scene we see makes us aware of practical as well as symbolic questions. It is rewarding, I argue, to explore, to explore both together the household arrangements and the representation of the scholarly self. After two years of the pandemic, with all its precarious new arrangements in intellectual and creative households, I imagine the entanglement of these two issues will seem familiar to many of us as these households and their inhabitants have become much more visible than before. We have learned to change within moments when we prepare for an important Zoom meeting from home, we dress a little more formally, even though we will be sitting at our kitchen table. We switch to controlled gestures and pronunciations and we transform into the persona we represent in the academic world. And we close the kitchen door and make sure the washing machine will not run during our online conversation. So, uh, but, oops, but every now and then a cat, a child, a noise may break through the virtual wall our conversation partner has chosen as a background and we suddenly became, become aware of how near personal and professional life have grown. Although we should not draw a direct line from the early modern humanists to situations of our days, we can note some striking similarities. We also, to borrow al words describing the humanists, use physical and symbolical means to put the world and the household that surrounds us at a distance, but also to ensure that the household functions in accordance with our needs. Tying in with this analysis, I argue that the concept of the persona and the analysis of forms of householding are helpful to understand through which practices, images, and narratives a learned person creates and retains a place in the world. It's, it goes to the wrong direction, but this has to do with the fact that I have it wrong way. So, Lauren Destin and Otto Siebum introduced the anthropological notion of the persona to the history of science in order to develop a more nuanced approach to the biographies of academics. They pointed out that academics and other professional specialists of the modern era use accounts of their lives to demonstrate their credentials for a particular professional position. These strategic narratives about origin and vocation follow certain patterns, templates, that are typical of a particular time and culture. And indeed, the often hagiographic biographies of famous scientists frequently are infused with fragments of the identity that the protagonists have crafted for themselves, reproducing their persona, which we should not misunderstand as their life. While we cannot freely invent our persona, we have some agency in this. A given model has to be respected, but it does not remain unchanged by the appropriations it undergoes. It has to be stated though that personas do not necessarily change at the same pace as the societies and institutions in which they thrive. As cultural images, they can be both ahead of their time and behind, can coexist in anachronistic ways and compete with each other. But how does this relate to issues of the household? Here I argue that only in privileged cases a protected space where a scientist, a scholar can work unencumbered by the cares and concerns of daily life is fully provided 
by an institution. Although he did not mention the household directly, Max Weber referred to this aspect quite openly in his 1917 lecture on science as a vocation. He warned his young listeners, all male in his perception, that if they did not have the means to survive for an extended period of time without making money from their scientific work, they should look for a more viable profession that would provide them with a secure income. This reference to economic circumstances can also be read as a way of talking about the conditions and surroundings scholarly and creative work requires to be free from mundane chores, to have someone who provides this daily support out of love or for money. To illustrate the gendered character of the scientific persona, I would like to invite you to take a look at a period that was marked by major institutional and cultural changes, namely the turn from the 19th to the 20th century. There has been considerable research into the institutional changes, the struggle for women's access to universities and the resistance that these bastions of male self-esteem put up to these changes. Juliane Jacobi, El Elke Kleiner or James Albicetti, to name but a few, have done important research on these issues. Here, however, I want to look at this period of transformation from a slightly different angle and follow the path of inspiring researchers like Mineke Bosch, Kirsti Niskanen or Falko Schnicke, who examined cases of gendered scientific personas in their various contexts. I used the case of Käthe Schirmacher, the second born daughter of a Protestant merchant family from Danzig, who later in her life became both a famous transnational feminist and a German nationalist, to explore both the strife to create a new scientific persona around 1900 and the private arrangements behind a career as a university educated intellectual. At a first glance, no scientific persona livable for a woman existed in the late 19th century. An academic career as a woman was perceived as a presumptuous wish and a foolish life plan that would sully the purity of the ac academy and spoil the girl's marriage prospects. Despite such disencouragement, Käthe Schirmacher dreamed of a life of learning, not of marriage or family. However, the institutional and social obstacles were enormous. Apart from the fundamental exclusion of women from German universities, the education girls received in the strongly gendered German school system in no way provided the educational fundamentals, such as Latin, Greek, or mathematics for university studies. The torturous career of Käthe Schirmacher ep epitomizes the lack of any straightforward entrance ways into academe for a woman. In the 1880s, German women had to go abroad to France or Switzerland to earn an academic degree. Lacking both the education and the funds necessary for university studies abroad, young Schirmacher started to earn money as a governess in 1883. It was only after 12 years of struggle and studies in several countries interrupted by illness and various employments that she gained a doctorate in Roman studies in Zurich in 1895. To get a sense of the motives and inspirations that may have behind Katie Schirmacher's plan to study, we must look to the years of her adolescence. At the age of 16, she observed growing difficulties in her once well-to-do family fueled by the economic failure of her father's company and various illnesses of both her parents. Having finished school, she pondered ways of becoming self-employed. Her observations of her elder sister's marriage intensified her desire for independence. She looked for advice from a peer to find out what options she might have. Her sister's younger brother-in-law, Hugo Münsterberg, two years her senior, had begun to study in Geneva in 1882. 
And in the summer of the same year, he sought to answer Schirmacher's many questions about her chances of enrolling as a student. And particularly, he did so in a long letter he sent to her on her 17th birthday. The epistle was not without some inadvertent humor. In stilted terms, the 19-year-old fledgling student lectured her about marriage and motherhood being incompatible with a woman's public appearance on a lectern. However, he also had a proposal that could open a back door for her into the academia. He needed someone to translate books important to him from English and French, which he did not read, into German. In exchange for her making German excerpts from them, he would teach her in his own fields of interest, in history and anthropology. He envisaged the cooperation as close and rewarding for both. Together, he tried to persuade her they would become an invincible team in an innovative field of research. It is hard to decide whether this was a veiled marriage proposal too, or if the eager young man just wanted to make use of his relative's competencies. However, what transpires in this letter of ambitious young Münsterberg who later was to become the founder of experimental psychology at Harvard, he actually learned English, uh, that this was a new model of cooperation between a man in an academic position and an educated woman supporting him. Schirmacher, however, turned down the offer and embarked, embarked on an individual way of learning. The cumbersome path Schirmacher took from studying in France and teaching in the UK until becoming probably the first German woman to earn a doctorate in Romance languages from the University of Zurich is too long to be told here. I do, however, want to show you a picture that conveys her struggle for an academic persona equal to male fellow students and allows a glimpse into what I would call her first academic household. In 1885, after quitting a less than satisfactory job as a governess, Schirmacher managed to turn a short stay in France, financed by a wealthy relative, in, um, to refine her French, this was the purpose of her stay there, uh, into a permanent stay in France, in Paris actually. She started tutoring French students in German, and two of them are in this picture. And eventually, she began to study German for the teacher's exam at the Sorbonne, together with her clients. Living on very modest means to minimize support from relatives, she shared a small flat with fellow student Julie Barbessa, whom you see in the dark dress on the left. The two women also exchanged French and German lessons to further boast their studies. As much as these four students posing for a photo after successfully having taken teacher's exams seemed to be in the same position at that moment, their supposed equality even being expressed in their similar posture, the chances ahead of them were quite different due to their gender as well as to their nationality. They all could become teachers in public secondary schools in France. However, the German Schirmacher had to take French citizenship for this, and this she didn't do. And only the two men had chances to go further and pursue an academic career. Another means Schirmacher chose to earn an income during her studies was literary writing. Her first anonymously published book, the short no novel Die Libertad, Liberty, portrays a group of former female fellow students who meet again a few years after their student days. They reflect on their various situations as educated women in different countries and share how they have faced, fared since leaving university. While the main character, Phil, lives as a single woman and maintains herself, the American Lotte 
is part of a working couple and collaborates with her husband as a lawyer. The third protagonist, an artist, Anne-Marie, is fatally ill. She has been too proud to seek help after losing the support of a wealth wealthy relative and has literally worked herself to death. The little book, which had a considerable public echo for the debut of an unknown and an anonymous author, was the first example of what would later become a flourishing genre of female student novels in German literature. The innovative genre reflected the emergence of a new, albeit extremely small group in European societies, female students, both fiercely criticized and eloquently idealized. While I cannot delve deeper into the various models discussed at the time, uh, Romana Weyershausen has written an interesting book about that. I want to say some words about the presumably autobiographical character of Schirmacher's book. Family members criticized that the author revealed too much from her own life. Her former advisor, Hugo Münsterberg, went even further and wrote her an anonymous letter accusing her of using individual experiences as proof for general facts. In his opinion, educated women were dirty competitors to academic men. But her first book also won Katie Schirmacher new, new friends. Among them was a young woman from a devout Protestant background, 21-year-old Helene Stöcker, later in her life, a well-known activist for sexual liberation and for peace. Like Münsterberg, she was convinced that the narrative was based on biographical experience. But this did not diminish the relevance of the book in her eyes, quite the contrary. She wrote to the author by way of the editor and asked for advice on how she could become a student herself. Helene Stöcker identified with Schirmacher's alter ego, Phil, by whom she felt comforted and inspired. The young admirer got the advice she needed from Schirmacher and the two women remained in contact for several years. What can we draw from these reactions? Firstly, I would hold that the autobiographical quite deliberately was hidden only superficially. On the one hand, the similarity to the author's life helped to guarantee the authenticity of the text and its political stance. While on the other hand, the fictional character allowed to create a model that barely existed in real life, a new persona, the female student. Secondly, the exchange between Stöcker and Schirmacher also demonstrates that it was never just about models, but also about practical issues, where to go, on what issues to focus, and who to ask for support. In the 1890s, when Schermacher received her doctorate, a female scholar existed only as an absolute exception. Her path at the fringes of academia as an independent social researcher, as a journalist, a lecturer, an activist, a translator, a politician, illustrates this. Therefore, in order to move to the second question of this talk and discuss aspects of the daily practice of a woman who lived off what she had learned at the university to understand her household arrangements, we need to further open the perspective and work with the broader definition of the professional intellectual personality. Since her studies in Paris, Schirmacher cohabited with women. Her first longtime companion, Margarete Böhm, followed her to Zurich and then to Paris. Böhm, a former pupil of Schirmacher, supported her in her work. She copied texts and dealt with other secretarial work for her, but also took care of the household in a shared flat. It is hard to say whether she received payment, did this work for room and board, or out of friendship or love. However, we do have documents that albeit chokingly, depict her as Schirmacher's wife. 
in a letter to her mother, Schemacher, whose nickname in the family was Katz, Cat, signed with your old Tomcat and wife. Next to the signature, she had drawn a bigger and a smaller cat, obviously the Tomcat, Tomcat Kete and the wife, Margarete. This reference to marital life was not a single occurrence. At another occasion, Schirmacher described their relationship as a happy marriage. In the correspondence between Margarete Böhm and Schirmacher's mother, Clara Schirmacher, Böhm both presented herself as secretarius and as Frau Doktorin, which is the German formal address for the wife of an academic with a doctorate. However, Böhm left Schirmacher because of her strained health in 1896. A nervous illness had been diagnosed. Another friend, Henriette Josefsson, who lived in the same tenement in Paris, inherited her role. Elisa Heinrich has described Schirmacher's intimate relationships to Böhm, Josefsson, and other partners in detail, and has also discussed whether they should be characterized as sexual relations. She, however, also highlighted some consistent patterns of these relationships, the division of labor, the household and secretarial work being the remit of Schirmacher's partners, as well as the inner hierarchy constituted by the admiration these women had for the self-assured and publicly active Schirmacher. Adding these practical aspects to Schirmacher's and her partner's self-descriptions, I think it is leg legitimate to employ the concept of the marriage to understand their relationship, even if this was not a legally binding relationship at the time. As Falko Schnicke has shown, the metaphor of the marriage was sometimes also used for the close collaboration between two men in research. The example, he cites, also conveys a hierarchy, the devotion to the support of an important representative of a discipline. From 1903 until her death, Käthe Schirmacher lived in an intimate relationship with Clara Schleker, who was 13 years her senior. In this relationship too, Schirmacher's partner had to take the brunt of supportive work. While Schirmacher traveled around lecturing, writing, earning the money the couple needed, Schleker took over most of the housework, but also did secretarial work for her partner. However, she also found the time to write two books of her own, interestingly enough, on women's work in the household. Time and again, household chores were an issue between the two women, particularly when the challenging challenges increased, such as after a prolonged period of illness that they both experienced. Coming back from a stay in medical care, Schemacher very explicitly discussed the difficulties with her partner. How much Schemacher was aware of the importance of domestic support for her career became evident in a conflict with Clara Schleker in the 1920s, when Schleker ran for the state parliament of Mecklenburg Schwerin and was elected. Schemacher, instead of congratulating her, sent an angry letter full of scorn because she expected to lose her partner's daily support, which she considered essential for her own work. Explicitly invoking the institution of marriage once again, she complained in her 1921 autobiography, politics took my housewife away from me. To better understand the personas involved in the relationship between domestic and secretarial work and scholarly or scientific work, it is worthwhile to broaden the perspective once more and to take a look at the practices of artists' households in the same time. The wife of the male artist was a much discussed and ambivalent figure in 19th century literature. Celebrated as an inspiring muse, she was often also disparaged as the housewife unable to grasp her husband's geniality, tormenting him with everyday worries. Her counterpart was the male genius, a persona 
conceived in the 18th century to liberate artists' creativity from traditional aesthetic models, but also, as Christine Battersby argued, to affirm creativity as a masculine quality in a time of changing gender roles. In her inspiring analysis of Gertrude Stein's famous book, The Autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, Nora Doyle shows how Stein laid bare the genius-wife dichotomy by her parodic appropriation of the form, content, and style of the domestic memoir, a specifically feminine form of autobiography consisting of the dual narrative of the domestic life of the author and the intellectual trajectory and genius of her husband, end of quote. She convincingly argues that Stein appropriated the voice of her partner, Alice B. Toklas, not only to confirm her own geniality, but to undermine the existing model of the genius. Stein used the form of the domestic memoir to, I quote, play with the personas of both wife and genius and relocate genius within a collaborative domestic space. Citing Stein's often quoted statement of the wives of geniuses, near genius, and might be geniuses, all having wives, Doyle infers that obviously Stein wanted to show that, I quote, the first qualification for a genius is the possession of a wife, end quote. The book's character Alice asserted Stein's dependence on her as she, uh, for instance, was the only person able to read Stein's handwriting. She furthermore suggested that through her intense domestic and secretarial work with works of art, she could recognize a brilliant piece of art. And here I quote from Gertrude Stein, I always say that you cannot tell what a picture really is or what an object really is until you dust it every day. And you cannot tell what a book is until you type it or proofread it." End of quote. Nora Doyle analyzes Gertrude Stein's redefinition of the genius as somebody who creates in a collaborative domestic space. Three points can be drawn from her analysis of Gertrude Stein's great and still enjoyable book. First, she identifies two enabling conditions of successful intellectual and artistic production. The support of practical and intellectual domestic labor, and second, the narrative of the wife in which a genius is produced, the domestic memoir. Thirdly, and this is told primarily through Tokla's refusal to write the book Stein had hoped for, the need to negotiate the division of labor between working couples again and again. And here a quote again from Stein, it does not look to me as you were ever going to write that autobiography. I'm going to write it for you, end of quote. There's a lot of laughter in that book. What the author is laughing at, I believe, is not those wives who support their genius husbands of whom Stein repeatedly speaks respectfully, but at a widespread discourse of male genius that is based on contempt for women. It is highly likely that Stein knew Alphonse Daudet, the author who had particular influence on this discourse. In a collection of sketches about the wives of artists, Les Femmes d'Artistes, Daudet held these women responsible for the artistic failures of their husbands. He portrayed marriage as a place where genius is ruined in the lowliness of the household and economic necessities. The book was a bestseller already at its first publication in 1874. It was reprinted several times and translated into several languages. Unfortunately, it can be said that making fun of women to disparage them has more than once guaranteed widespread approval of a work of art but I'm not sure that explains the book's success sufficiently. 
because at the same time as making all these snide remarks, Dodé also painted an unattainable ideal, the image of a woman who can hardly ever be found, who at the same time understands the artist's production and supports him, has his back and is an intellectual partner. He might have thought about his own wife. Julia Daudet, pictured here on the left, was herself a prolific writer and journalist and at the same time ceaselessly cared for her husband, who was confined to a wheelchair due to syphilis from an early age. When Gertrude Stein talks about wives of geniuses in her autobiography, she may well have been thinking about this brave woman. The Wives of Geniuses, she invoked echoed the title of the first English translation of today's book, Wives of Men of Genius. The feminist critique that was formulated in the 1980s and 1990s could be linked to this and the extent to which Julia Dudet could be rediscovered as a forgotten, forgotten genius could be examined, perhaps also how her husband's work made use of her art. But that is not my central interest here, as tempting as it would be. Rather, my argument is that intellectual cooperation in working couples is a common mode in which female productivity comes into play and is therefore worth exploring, regardless of whether one or both of the protagonists involved were a genius or not. Before I have to break off, I would like to leave you with the image of two very different poises of the intellectual that are narratively invoked. Max Weber took some time in his famous lecture on science as a vocation to talk about the physicality and daily practice of academic work. He talked about the need to work long hours at the desk, even though this can often be fruitless. He then contrasted this daunting image with the spontaneous inspiration that can emerge anywhere. In his case, obviously while relaxing on the sofa. In doing so, he tacitly, no, uh, relaxing. However, he considered both necessary. The long hours of work and smoking on the sofa. In doing so, he tacitly acknowledged that this practice had to be facilitated by circumstances and housemates that allowed for both. The turning away from people around him for days at a time and the lounging around with a cigar. The legal historian and feminist activist Marianne Weber, who among other things, wrote an important book on the wife and mother in the history of law, had taken the path that Schirmacher had rejected to become the life companion of an important academic man. Unlike Schirmacher's wife, Clara Schleker, Marianne Weber gave up her political mandate when her husband received a call for a professorship in Munich. And after Max Weber's early death, it was her conscious decision to become the custodian of his legacy. We might see more than one reason behind that choice that has been debated from various perspectives. Bebel Moira's comprehensive biography and the critique it has received has added new material, but has also opened new questions. My concern here, however, is something else. I'm interested in Weber's very clear realization that being the widow of a genius was a more promising mode of participation in prestigious academic networks then struggling as a middle-aged widowed woman to establish an individual career in the academe. Taking on the role of the high priest at the altar of the desk of her late husband um, was therefore certainly a worthwhile choice of persona if she managed to secure his fame. Her 1926 biography of her husband and her memoirs should therefore also be read in the light of Gertrude Stein's reflections on the domestic memoir as an important element of the production of a genius. To conclude, and I would like to conclude with some suggestions. 
In this talk, I argued that to embark on a successful academic career, it needs both an available scholarly persona compatible with one's life path that secures a scholar a place in the world and daily support uh, in academic and non-academic issues. I argue that creative work requires a kind of household that allows the person doing that work forgetfulness of the world, at least for some time. I wanted to demonstrate that it could be rewarding to connect these two research perspectives that are often studied separately. The gender division of labor in the academic household and the personas, images and narratives scientists and scholars choose to represent their scholarly selves. I think it's still highly important to examine the gendered collaboration within researchers' households as Dorinda Utram, Helena Pusia, and others have done since the 1980s. However, I would advocate broadening this perspective. We should also analyze how these households are represented by particular personas in the academia and beyond. Therefore, I also believe that we should analyze more thoroughly the importance of gender for the concept of the personas as it has been circulating in the history of science since the early 2000s. In this context, I feel that it could be extremely fruitful to explore not only the persona of the influential researcher responsible for major advances in a particular field, but to also explore the personas available to the more hidden figures in the process of knowledge, knowledge production. The persona of the secretary, the collaborating wife, the translator, the family member providing the comfort of a home. How are they represented in the public at the time and in historical retrospect? The history of the academic household and the history of available personas need to be studied together to better understand how they interact. By this, I do, however, not mean to simply mixing them or reading one as a mirror of the other. Quite the opposite. I propose to explore their often complex relationships to each other in order to be able to analyze their contradictions and anachronisms, their different but interrelated logics. When investigating the history of women in science, we should bear in mind that they too need the support of an academic household to be successful. For them, however, this support was and often still is much harder to find. When we look at what has become of the careers of the increasing numbers of women who have studied at the university since the beginning of the 20th century, we should perhaps question the sharp distinction between those who against all odds have gone on to have successful careers and those who in search of a persona that would earn them respect in society and a position that would provide them with a livelihood have become the supportive wives of academic men. Following on from this, I argue that it would be rewarding for the history of science to examine the various uses of the genius wife model that has become one possible form for, of a woman's entry into the academia. In gendered terms, we can say that the academic working couple model grants the male part support in a variety of issues as it takes advantage of female intellectuality and creativity. However, when discussing the complex relationship between the study, the laboratory, the studio, and the household, we should not limit ourselves to repeating the obvious that many women were exploited in these relationships. We should also look into how these relationships were productive in more than one respect. Among other things, they sometimes gave women access to intellectual networks otherwise difficult to reach. 
and they could allow them the sovereign position of the person who recognized the genius and became the keeper of a legacy. With the case studies I have presented, I have proposed to broaden the perspective on creative collaborations and academic households. More specifically, I argue that to better understand the equalities and inequalities and the precarious balances of academic um, and creative households, it can be useful not to fixate on heterosexual relationships. If one looks closely, a variety of queer relationships can be discovered in creative and intellectual fields of work. Firstly, their contribution to knowledge production must be recognized. They need to be seen. But there is, secondly, also a methodological benefit. Analyzing them both as case studies of what takes place in similar ways also in more conventional households and as examples of an avant-garde of new normalities contributes significantly to the history and sociology of intellectual and creative work processes. Looking at the different forms that academic and creative households have taken over time and in different cultures might also broaden our perspective on the precariousness of those households today. It might sharpen our perception of the inequalities within and between them. And as a side effect, it could also remind us to remain friendly with the pets that many of us invited into their dwellings during the solitude of the pandemic and not to evict them after the crisis. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>